All right, I'm just clarifying. You can hear me and see my slides? We. Oui. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. We can see the slides. That's perfect. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, good morning in San Francisco. Good uh, late afternoon in Paris. Um, I'm Elliot Shear. I'm a child neurologist, um, and I run a research group that um, studies uh, DDX. Um, and actually, uh, the prior speaker was making uh, comments about um, about using uh, human cell lines. And I would say that's not what I'm talking about today, but we have a, an effort ongoing in the lab. So I'd be happy to chat with you about that at another time. So. Le message est passé. Okay. So this is a picture um, of um, a, uh, a compendium of genetic mutations um, so what you can see on the left um, is chromosome one, and you see on the right is the X chromosome, so the, the last chromosome. Um, and all of the little dots that you can see um, here are different genes that are involved in, um, in brain development. And all the ones that are above the dotted red line that I'm trying to display right here, um, all of the ones above that line are statistically significant and linked um, to um, neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and the higher up it is, uh, the, the more powerful the genetic association is. Um, so that's, that's the, the line right there. Um, and then here is a DDX, 3X. We all know that it's on the X chromosome, which is why it's all the way over to the right in this in this pictograph, um, but you can also see how high up it is in terms of its um, statistical association. So DDX is both tightly linked to developmental disorders and is um, surprisingly relatively common. And then we, we did this same analysis here. Um, many of the families um, have noted um, that kids with DDX mutations can have abnormalities of the corpus callosum. And I'm gonna show pictures of that in, in just a moment. Um, but this is essentially the same kind of analysis, what we call a Manhattan plot, um, where the chromosomes are listed um, from left to right and the statistical association is from uh, bottom to top. Um, and again, so this is instead of overall neurodevelopment. This is specifically participants or families where the child has a disorder of the corpus callosum. Um, and you can see again that DDX is highly linked uh, to uh, disorders of the corpus callosum and arguably one of the more strongly linked of, of, all, of all the known genes. Um, one of the things that we've been studying is the association of specific mutations. So um, many of the many of the models that people have been studying are um, knockout or or nonsense mutations. Um, whereas what we're showing you here are are different mutations depending on the specificity. So there are two regions in the um, in the protein um, that are important for function. One is the helicase that binds ATP. So helicase meaning that it unravels, and I'll show you that picture in just a moment, unravels um, the RNA. Um, and there are two structures to this, the C-terminal aspect of it, as well as the ATP binding. Um, all of the ones um, that are inside of these two domains are gonna be missense mutations um, and, um, highly, and highly linked. Um, and a subset of these um, mutations um, that, are, that are in blue here um, have a particular change in brain anatomy called polymicrogyria. Okay, 
So this is the schematic um, that allows us to better understand what's going on in the function of the protein. So you can see here that there is a schematic of an ATP molecule and as well as double-stranded RNA. Um, and then this is the protein itself, DDX. And if you recall, I just showed you two, two regions of the protein, the ATP region and, and the helicase C-terminal region. And those are displayed here um, in, this, in this cartoon version of DDX. And then when ATP and the double-stranded RNA um, are um, linked or are touching the, uh, the DDX protein, we're able to unravel the RNA. So it starts out over here being double-stranded. So meaning the two strands are, are linked together or interwoven together. And then over here, when the enzymatic activity of the protein is, is done, it's separated the... Oops, separated this um, into two RNA molecules and the ATP is being hydrolyzed. And then to better understand that in, in, in the cell or, or you know, in vivo, um, what we're seeing here is the ribosome, which is the structure that um, allows proteins to be synthesized. And the ribosome starts out um, being, um, basically being delayed entry into the, into the process. And it's delayed that way through forming this schematic hairpin loop that you can see here. And when there is a mutation, it can't unravel this any further. And it's stuck um, with the ribosome here and the RNA um, bound to it and, and no further progress is made. However, in a normal situation, where the, uh, there is no mutation, the RNA um, interacts with um, the DDX protein and the ribosomes, um, and you're able to unravel it, and the ribosome advances uh, beyond, and you get production of protein synthesis. So can we use that knowledge that I've just told you um, to better understand which of the DDX mutations are more severe um, or more mild. And so again, this is, if you look at panel A, these dark bands just refer to where uh, the RNA is. And so in this picture here, the double-stranded RNA um, is right here. And this is just starting out in this unraveling process at a time of zero seconds, so right at the very beginning of this assay. And then by 120 seconds, as you can see over here, all of the RNA is unraveled um, and none of the double-stranded RNA remains. So that's how it works um, in, uh, in a normal um, uh, DDX, 3X protein, um, where it can unravel the RNA really quickly. Um, however, if there's a mutation, this process gets slowed down. So if you take that concept in mind and you look, for example, here and here, so the blue dots are the dots that are um, seen in, um, in normal uh, DDX protein. Um, and so that's displayed here where it says wild type. Um, however, there are other versions of this where there are specific mutations. So for example, here where you see R376C, so that's a, an, a an amino, single amino acid mutation changing an arginine to a cysteine. And that activity then, oops, that activity can be seen here in the green line. So it's not as fast as the wild type as the normal protein, which is over here. Um, but it's not as slow as the ones that are over here that almost have no activity at all. So for comparison, children who have the R376C mutation um, are more mildly affected, whereas the children who have um, mutations that are down here 
for example, the R326H, that's the red triangle that I'm pointing to, those are more severe mutations. So we're able to both model um, potentially how we can use um, drugs and, and other means to interfere with this process, um, but we can also monitor um, how generally how severe um, the condition is likely to be based on these kinds of analyses of mutations. Okay. Um, that information um, is also um, intertwined with the work that the lab has been doing, studying the clinical presentation of uh, children who carry DDX mutations. So these are um, pictures um, of uh, participants in studies um, that we've done both um, in our lab as well as collaboratively with Dr. Kleefstra's group. Um, and you can see here that there are some shared facial features, including a long um, hypotonic low tone face, um, a high uh, broad nasal tip. Let's... Um, and hypertelorism, which means that the eyes are separated by um, a greater distance than average. Um, and they also have microcephaly, meaning that they have um, smaller heads. And you can see that um, more clearly, um, for example, here in individual 12 and individual 11. Okay. Um, so there, um, at the time that we pulled this uh, together, um, there were um, three main papers uh, describing the clinical features of, of DDX. One of them, again, from Dr. Kleefster's group, um, uh, the folks um, in Baylor by Wang et al., and then um, Lennox et al. is, is our group at um, UCSF in collaboration with the folks um, at, uh, at Duke. And so there's about 150 um, individuals that have been identified, um, and we've looked at a number of different clinical features. Oops. So you can see here um, that many of them have behavioral difficulties. Many of them have low tone. Um, and 100% uh, of the children that have been enrolled in our studies um, have uh, developmental delay or intellectual disability. Now, that 100% is a, may be a little bit misleading. Um, there's obviously an ascertainment bias um, at the beginning of any understanding um, of developmental conditions, you're going to be um, scrutinizing children who have who have clinical challenges, and so it's sort of a self uh, referring, uh, self referential uh, uh, identification of kids who have difficulties. But of those kids, if you then move forward you can see that there are other difficulties um, that they have. So for example, um, not all the children have microcephaly. It's more like 25% to um, a third. Um, many um, have other problems like scoliosis, hearing impairment. Um, many, as I mentioned, um, um, many of the children also have epilepsy. So in the initial report from from Kleistra's group, um, about 16% had seizures, so um, not high, but, but still a significant percentage. And in our group, we had 20% uh, of the children uh, with seizures. Okay. Okay. Um, and I mentioned earlier that some of the individuals have um, a particular brain anatomy change called polymicrogyria or PMG, which is I'm gonna use for short. Um, and the children um, who have PMG are in our, in our eyes more likely to have um, a greater set of developmental challenges. So what we've done is we've grouped them here for individuals who have PMG, individuals who don't have PMG, and then the combined total. Uh, over to the far right. 
And so if we compare, for example, microcephaly, so the smaller um, head size, you can see that children who don't have PMG, only a third of them um, have microcephaly, whereas the it's admittedly a smaller number, but those individuals who do have PMG, um, a full 70% of them um, have, have um, microcephaly. So the very, very strong association. Um, and for those of you who think of, about brain anatomy, that, that often um, makes a lot of sense. Low tone is again, another feature, but in that case, just simple low tone is ironically more likely to be associated um, in the non-PMG crowd. However, if we look at individuals who have a mixture of low and high tone, um, more in the, the general domain of cerebral palsy, you can see that 60% um, or 64% have um, this mixed low and high tone, whereas um, the, those who have no PMG, um, only a third or less have that mixed tone. <clears throat> Um, and then another feature um, that is um, uh, important to understand is there is a linkage uh, between um, cardiac abnormalities um, and the development of the neural crest um, and the development of cortical malformations. And so again, you can see here the non-PMG individuals, only 10% of them have a cardiac um, uh, anatomic uh, malformation, whereas a full 50% of those who have PMG also have um, that associated feature. There are um, other um, aspects that are clinically important. Um, just very, very briefly, um, a full 50%, as you can see here on the top, of the DDX carriers um, after the age of five, so still, you know, fairly likely uh, most kids um, are able to be verbal by that point, but a full 50% of the DDX girls were uh, not, not verbal. Um, and I, again, I'm just going to um, move down here and, and repeat this uh, concept about cardiac defects. Um, and there was a, a recent paper uh, by a group that was studying the neural crest, um, and they found that the DDX protein um, is responsible for inducing the formation of the neural crest um, through AKT signaling. Um, and again, we had a nice talk earlier about Wnt signaling, um, and there's a significant overlap between this AKT signaling, Wnt signaling, and, and DDX function. Um, DDX has also been uh, linked to uh, cancer. Um, it works as a secondary driver in many cancers, meaning that it's it's not the initial mutation, but a secondary mutation that leads leads to the cancers. And I've listed a few of them that show up more commonly here: um, medulloblastoma and glioblastoma um, in the central nervous system, B cell lymphomas, and, and prostate cancer. Um, and there are other ones as well. Um, however, these features here do not refer to um, children with um, a primary mutation in DDX. These are all ones where there's a secondary mutation um, in DDX. The only place where, where DDX appears to be the primary driver is, is quite rare. There have been four cases identified around the world so far. Um, where there's a, a mutation um, in DDX that is linked uh, to neuroblastoma. Um, thankfully, all of those individuals had um, either surgical or chemotherapeutic um, cure. It was found um, at a young age um, and, and responded to rather quickly. Okay. Um, I mentioned that the DDX is um, linked to brain anatomic changes, um, including PMG. And I just want to point out a few of these other ones. 
Um, so again, a partial, partially absent corpus, corpus callosum or a thin corpus callosum um, is present um, in non-PMG individuals. There's only one uh, case where we identified that, but in, in PMG individuals, it was three out of 11, so 27%. So more commonly linked those two together. Um, ventricles are enlarged in, in both PMG and non-PMG carrying individuals. Um, and colpocephaly, which is a particular um, distortion of, of ventricle shape, is also present. Okay. Um, here is an opportunity to take a look at some of these images because they're difficult to, to understand without visualizing them. So... Over here is C for control. So we have um, a sagittal image where this is the front of the face here, this is the back, um, and this is the normal corpus callosum right here, normally shaped and normally sized. Um, but by comparison, um, there are two individuals here. This one has a thin corpus callosum by comparison to the corpus callosum right here. And then this individual here in B um, has no corpus callosum at all. Um, there are other features. So there are, is, as I mentioned, enlargement of the, of the ventricles. So the ventricles can be seen here, here um, in this coronal view. Again, this is left, this is right and this is uh, top and bottom. And then the ventricles can also be enlarged when looked at through the axial plane. So again, this is the front of the head and the, the back of the head down below. Move this out of the way. And then, um, as I mentioned, um, patients also have PMG or polymicrogyria. And that is evident here in, in D, where this kind of jaggedy edges here, or these little jaggedy edges here, um, are um, associated with or are representations of PMG, um, polymicrogyria, so many small curves. Um, and then if you look here, what we've done is we've displayed the actual mutation. So this one here is R326H, so arginine to histidine. Um, this missense mutation is, these are two separate individuals in here in D and E. And even though um, they're separate individuals, they have very, very similar um, anatomic changes uh, based on the mutation being the primary driver. Okay, we, we discussed that. Okay, and then can, can these brain changes that we see tell us or give us insight into how um, the children are going to develop? So this is just two examples right here. This is, again, this is the sagittal view. This is the front of the face, the, the back of the head. So this is the sagittal, this is the coronal view. Um, this is the top and this is right and left. Um, and then the axial view, um, meaning this is front to back and side to side. Um, and you, can see that this individual here has a much thicker and larger corpus callosum than this individual here. Um, and similarly, the amount of white matter, um, which is the structures that connect the different parts of the brain, um, there's more of the white matter, which in these pictures, it's, it's inverse, the white matter is dark gray. So you can look here, there's a lot of dark gray on both sides uh, of this brain, whereas this child here has a much smaller amount of that. 
and we conducted um, Vineland behavioral analyses on these individuals. And you can see that the child who has the larger corpus callosum and a greater volume of white matter has a Vineland score of 81, which is just a little bit below, um, uh, or actually is on, on the border between being normal um, and being a little bit um, impaired. Whereas this individual here who has the smaller corpus callosum and diminished white matter volume has a score of 47, which is markedly low. Um, so th there may be important insights that we can um, use uh, both from the genetic mutation that the children carry, as well as um, these, um, these specific anatomic features. So what can we do to, to, to increase our understanding of how children with DDX um, develop um, and um, what sort of challenges they confront both um, both initially when they're first diagnosed, but importantly, longitudinally over time. And so we are collaborating um, uh, with a, a series of other groups, um, both here at UCSF, um, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, uh, Rush um, School of Medicine in Chicago, and Mount Sinai in um, New York. And so this is going to be a, both a cross-sectional and longitudinal um, analysis where children are evaluated um, every other uh, year or every year. Um, families will be completing surveys um, as well as um, coming to visit one of the four sites um, and engaging um, in a more comprehensive analysis. Um, this, we hope, will... Um, help us understand uh, the condition in a, in a more sophisticated and, and, and deeper way. Um, we will also um, be obtaining blood samples um, that we can use for biomarker development and the generation of iPSCs that we'll make available um, to, to all qualified investigators, which we hope will accelerate the process. Okay, just again, as a reminder, um, uh, there's a, a rapidly growing uh, number of individuals who each have unique uh, mutations. You can see them here, all the ones um, where there's no number, uh, there's, no, um, there's no recurrence of that particular mutation. Whereas some of the other ones, like this R376C that, that I've been talking about, um, seems to be more common. We already have six individuals who carry that same mutation. Um, and so both the location of the mutation, um, its, its response on enzymatic assays, um, and also the kind of uh, brain imaging features that are repeated um, gives us a greater insight and hopefully uh, encouragement that we can better understand these conditions through these analyses. So in, in summary, uh, DDX accounts for one to 3% of all cases of girls with global developmental delay. So it is, it is literally one of the most common uh, of all neurodevelopmental disorders in, in girls. Um, most of the cases that we've seen so far are de novo um, in, in females. Um, there are cases in males, those are rare. Um, and those can actually be um, inherited um, and um, have the mutations be more mildly affected um, in the girls um, and more severely affected in the boys. Um, the biochemical assays that I showed you give um, a tight correlation um, with clinical outcomes as well as with brain imaging findings. Um, and we're optimistic that these kinds of approaches, um, as well as the others that you've been hearing um, over the last couple of days, gives, um, gives greater insight into the condition um, and may hopefully give us um, 
uh, insights as to how we might approach clinical treatment. So um, there are many individuals from, from my lab listed here. This is Dr. Stephen Floor, who's a, um, a collaborator at UCSF, and he and I at um, Dr. Silver from Duke are the main uh, collaborators um, in, a, in a, a joint study that we're pulling together. Um, and then here are some students um, in, in my lab, Lindsay and Brianna um, and Ruichi, um, who have all um, been significant participants in, in the lab's efforts. Um, and I just want to point out, I mentioned it at the beginning, but just to repeat, um, we are um, collecting um, patient blood samples as well as blood samples from moms to make them into induced uh, pluripotent stem cells um, that can then be uh, differentiated by various protocols into um, neuron, neuron progenitors or uh, mature neurons um, as well as um, other cell types. But we've been focusing on um, on cortical neuron production using this approach. All right, thank you very much.